dismiss the teens to their class. Trust that you, trust that you have a, a good class time together and appreciate your help with the tables afterward for those who will stay through. Uh, they'll set up a few tables in the fellowship hall uh, for those staying through. Otherwise, we'll turn back to Matthew 13. This will be our last lesson in our series on evangelism and the local church as we've been using the kingdom parables from Matthew 13 as kind of our springboard in our study. All right, we'll do a quick review, and then we'll get into, Lord willing, some uh, practical tips as well as some case studies from the life and ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in some witnessing um, examples, evangelism opportunities, and uh, none greater than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his uh, witnessing and his evangelistic efforts, and we'll look at some of those in case studies today. Matthew 13, kingdoms, parable, kingdom parables, the sower and the seed at the beginning of Matthew 13, and then dropping down to Matthew 13 and verse 24, there is uh, the explanation, interpretation of the parable of the sower and the seed. And then down to verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. And then also in Matthew 13 and verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. So we've looked at those specifically. We again may see our efforts as just a grain of mustard seed, but we are looking at the power of the gospel. We have the opportunity, the privilege, the responsibility, the command to be witnesses, to be ambassadors with this ministry of reconciliation, to be giving the gospel to every creature, or to be witnesses as Acts 1.8 says, in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the utmost parts of the earth. We go down to Matthew 13, down to verse 36, and then we see another uh, kingdom parable, the parable of the tares. And we know that there are some who will be rejectors of the truth, rejectors of Jesus Christ, that will be tares sown among the wheat. And we are to declare the gospel knowing that some will reject, some will be hard and calloused, and maybe even persecute, but we are still to declare the gospel boldly, not to worry about the results, we're to water and we're to plant, knowing that it is who that gives the increase? God. We're to be faithful with declaring the gospel, we're to have a good testimony, of course. We've talked about lifestyle evangelism, that's great, but it's not enough. We need to declare the facts of the gospel, the truths. And we'll talk about some of those uh, specific cases here as we review. And then further parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13, 44 through 52. The treasure and the pearl of great price. When a person comes under conviction and in, the, and in being drawn to the Lord in repentance and faith, they recognize the treasure, the pearl of great price. And they come in saving faith. But there are some who, in rejecting the truth, they ignore the treasure. They are blinded to the pearl of great price. They don't see the value because they love their sin. And that's why it's so important that we have to declare the hard truths of the gospel that we are all sinners, but that sin is very personal. That we all are in a state outside of Christ of rebellion and rejection as enemies. And there's the requirement of repentance, of turning from our sin and turning to Christ and saving faith. Judas, again, did he truly repent when the Bible says that he went out and hung himself? He repented of what he had done? Was that a true biblical repentance? Judas was in a state of regret. I know the King James uses the word repent there. It's the sense that he changed his mind about what he had done in the regret of his betrayal of Christ, but it did not result in saving faith, did it? So there are some who will go through some reform or go through some regret, but not all paths lead to God, like the Pope just tried to say. We'll look at that again in Joshua today as... Israel, again, is in conquest of Canaan. Did Joshua and Israel go into Canaan and say all paths lead to God? 
you're going to get to God your way, we're going to get to God our way, and we're just going to learn how to get along. Is that what they did when they invaded Canaan? It was a declared truth that there is one way to heaven, there is one way, and that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ himself. Now, they were looking ahead to the cross, but Rahab and the Gibeonites and just a small remnant from Canaan saw Israel's God as the only way. There was to be no compromise, no capitulation, no assimilation without repentance and true saving faith. The Gibeonites were not allowed to assimilate except that they repented. Rahab was not allowed to assimilate and eventually be a part of the Messianic genealogy. She was not allowed to assimilate by continuing in her immoral, idolatrous, pagan religion. She had to repent and turn to God in saving faith, looking ahead to the cross. So we are carriers of a treasure, of a pearl of great price. But people are blinded. We're not trying to get a better seed bag, a better looking seed bag. We're, we're breaking up hard ground. Hard soil with the truth of the gospel, with the truth of God's word. We're plucking stones. We're pulling up weeds. That involves sometimes some very hard conversations and some, sometimes some very uh, challenging witnessing opportunities. I'm not saying that we should do like this one kid that's on YouTube. He goes into Chick-fil-A and stands on the table and screams and yells and calls everybody sinners on their way to hell. I don't think that's the best method to go to Chick-fil-A and stand on the table and yell and scream at everybody. To stand in the hardware store in the aisle and call everybody sinners and tell them they're all going to hell if they don't repent. And the worker from the hardware store has to come over and say, sir, you're not allowed to do, do, be doing this. And then he puts on his YouTube channel that a demon infested the hardware store. I don't think that's the, the method, right? <laughs> we have a treasure, a pearl of great price, but there's a blinding, there's a veil over the eyes. We're calling them to repentance by pointing them to the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's word, the power of the and we're to go about it in a spirit of gentleness and meekness, and there is a right way to do it. <laughs> Again, standing on the table at Chick-fil-A, going into the hardware store and yelling and screaming, don't think those are the right methods. We, we have some methods that I believe we can use that are emphasizing the truth of the gospel, the power of the gospel unto salvation. We've talked about the seven seas of history. Uh, you can break them down into four, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Understanding how we got here, the fact that we are... Uh, sinners, that what's wrong in the world is because of us, because of our rebellion against God. And uh, we even uh, heard recently a, a lecture um, at the Creation Museum, and I was surprised by the number of individuals. I'm talking about mainstream, national, evangelical preachers. I was disappointed at how many believe in millions and billions of years and try to reconcile that with Genesis 1 and six literal 24-hour days of creation with God resting on the seventh. I was shocked at some of the names of mainline, mainstream, evangelical, nationally recognized preachers who try to reconcile millions and billions of years with Genesis 1. I was just surprised. Creation, fall, what's wrong with the world is sin. We're all sinners, but there's a personal aspect to that. And we see the depravity of man. We've seen some headlines this week. I mean, some of the things that we're hearing coming out of that whole Sean Combs, P. Diddy stuff, it is absolutely disgusting. The Republican governor candidate down in North Carolina, some of the people that were involved in our government during COVID that were doing some wicked orgy type of parties while everybody else was supposed to be sitting at home with their masks on, right? And they're having their public orgies. Some of this stuff is coming out four years later, and I'm thinking, these are the people that lead our society? 
These are the entertainers and the celebrities that people have spent millions and billions of dollars going to their concerts and listening to their garbage music and paying the money to watch them on this big screen and they are absolute reprobate perverts, the depravity of man's heart. I mean, in a sense, that's what we're up against. But it's the power of the gospel that can change those lives just as he changed our life. And if not for the grace of God, so go we. The heart is certainly deceitful and desperately wicked. I had an email just this, in the last couple of weeks, somebody who, will, who hopefully will come to our church. He, he sent an email and he said, I haven't been in church for years. And he said, but there's something wrong with the world. And I've been on your website listening to your, your, your services. And I am thankful that you and your church preach the gospel and believe uh, the word of God. And I want to come visit and he said, I just know I need to be back in church because there's something wrong with the world. Yes! <laughs> a lot of people are saying that. But the answer is found in Jesus Christ, in the gospel. And that's the only way of forgiveness, redemption, and a home in heaven, and eternity with, with God as Lord and Savior. Romans Road is a method we've talked about. Our personal testimony is good, but of course it has to lead to a uh, gospel, factual gospel in invitation, presentation. Uh, lifestyle evangelism is good, but it's, it's not enough. The way of the master uh, is, a, is a good method, using Jesus' example of the rich young ruler and the Ten Commandments and the violation of the law. It's a very confrontational type of approach. I realize that that's not uh, always uh, advantageous, but uh, you can go online, there's a whole channel uh, Ray Comfort is the one who advocates for that method, and it can be effective. Gospel tracts, I think, that are scriptural, that are not just a story and a poem and a sinner's prayer, but good, factual, scriptural, uh, biblical tracts. I love the bridge tract, Who is Jesus? Which Church Saves? Uh, those are just a few of the ones. Uh, there are others that are out there. I think that uh, this God's Simple Plan of Salvation is a good tract. It has lots of gospel Lots of scripture in it. It's been, uh, God has used that track for years. I've been to the LifeGate. Uh, they're out on the west side of Indianapolis, but I've been to the LifeGate Ministries that's printed God's Simple Plan of Salvation uh, for years. And uh, that's uh, it's incredible work, what they have done through the years in printing tracks that have gone all over the world. Uh, there are other good uh, tracks that are out there as well. But I like scriptural tracts, and I like to use tracts in more of a personal and a relational way. Again, putting a tract on the toilet paper dispenser in the stall, putting a tract between the cans of veggies in the grocery store, I, I just don't know if those are the most effective ways. I really think that a personal contact, handing it to somebody, even better if we can open it up and go through it, but gospel tracts can be effective tools. All right, so let's look at um, again, for review, Acts 2, Acts 6, we talked about Peter at Pentecost, how he, in his preaching, he corrected misunderstandings regarding Christ, the Scripture, speaking primarily to Jews who had an understanding of the Old Testament, but they were wrong in their view of the Messiah and their understanding of the Old Testament, and he uh, preached Jesus while correcting their insufficient understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures. We know 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2, and there were thousands more added to the church in uh, the days after. Acts 6, Stephen, what an opposite, con what a contrast. From Acts 2 to Acts 6, did Stephen declare the truth of the gospel? Did he preach the Messiah? He sure did, but what happened to Stephen? He got stoned. That's the thing, we have to go and we have to declare the truth. We don't know if we're going to have a Pentecost type of experience or if we're going to have a Stephen type of experience, but we are responsible to declare the truth. There are some people who we witness to, and they are very antagonistic. They might even become persecutors. There are others who are very receptive. As a matter of fact, who was standing nearby that came under conviction shortly after, who watched Stephen be stoned? It was Saul who became Paul. Yeah, exactly. We never know. There might be people who are watching us get persecuted and how we respond and God is working in their heart. So we have to be faithful to the word of God. 
And then Acts 8, we talked about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch going from a revival in Samaria down to the Gentile in the desert who was curious, who was reading the book of Isaiah, the scroll, Isaiah 53, and he preached unto him Jesus. The Ethiopian eunuch got saved. Our understanding from church history is that he then took the gospel into sub-Saharan Africa. Acts 10, Peter and Cornelius, we talked about him last week. A religious man who had general revelation, was even giving alms, from what we understand, to the temple, to the Jews. He had a form of godliness, but he was denying the power thereof until he came in repentance and faith. There was also the outpouring and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and a visual sign, the speaking in tongues as a sign gift, a temporary sign gift for the Jews to recognize that the gospel, the Holy Spirit, was even for the Gentiles, because there was still a lot of misunderstanding. As a matter of fact, even Peter himself, <laughs> before Cornelius came, was still struggling with where the Gentiles fit into God's kingdom. And that was a very clear teaching moment to Peter and to the Jews, that Cornelius belonged in the kingdom. And the uh, sign gift, gift of tongues, uh, was there and evident as a sign gift to the Jews, that the Gentiles are part of God's, that the Gentiles, uh, upon repentance and saving faith, are also welcome in God's kingdom. Acts 17, we talked about Paul at Mars Hill, and we went through that last week. We began at creation, used the Bible's teaching regarding creation to lead to a gospel presentation. Paul would reason with the Jews out of the scriptures. And then Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. Paul declared, preached to them Jesus. And Agrippa, we read last week in Acts 26. Almost, he said, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He was under deep conviction. Paul appealed to him. And we can sense that sometimes in our gospel invitations. We can sense sometimes, can we, that somebody's under conviction? And I don't think there's anything wrong with pressing in that moment for a decision. Would you like to trust Christ as your Savior right now? Paul did that with Agrippa. And sometimes they are ready and there's fruit ripe for the picking. And sometimes they're like Agrippa and they say, eh, not right now, maybe, maybe later. And Agrippa was still held by his power. He knew, as we see many times, people who have power and celebrity status, money. Sometimes they're unwilling, aren't they? Because they know if they come to Christ, they are going to lose recognition, power, money, celebrity status, whatever it is. And that's the veil that's blinding. There's a treasure and a pearl of great price. Those who come in saving faith are willing to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. If they truly come to Christ in saving faith, they will seek out that treasure. They will seek for that pearl of great price under conviction of sin, in repentance, in saving faith, and they will come and be, be truly saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a call of repentance and true saving faith. That's not a Judas who regretted, but what did he do? He went out and hung himself. There was a regret or a reform, but not true saving faith. And we see people like that. They want to reform their life. They want to tack Jesus on. They want to add him. They want to use the gospel or Christianity as a moral good. And we see some people that seem so close, conservative people, religious people, moralistic people. They are so close. They have a head knowledge. They know the facts. But they're just this close, it seems, to... Truly trusting Christ and saving faith, but there's something holding them back. Recognition, power, money, something that's holding them back from truly coming uh, to Christ. But again, our responsibility is to declare to them Jesus, declare the truth of the gospel. All right, so... Some case studies uh, quickly this morning from the life of Jesus Christ. I love... Uh, really, the master teacher, Christ Himself, the master evangelist, in Acts. Excuse me, in John chapter three. I still had Acts on my mind. In John three, 
What does Jesus do? We don't have time to read all these passages in their entirety. But obviously, there was a drawing of Nicodemus to Christ. Jesus himself said, If I be lifted up, I draw all men unto myself. Obviously, Nicodemus, as a religious leader, it would have taken a great amount of courage. It would have taken some level of risk to come to Jesus because the religious leaders were not liking the fact that Jesus was disrupting their system, was accusing them of being sinners, in many cases worse than the very publicans whom they looked down and thumbed their noses at. And yet Jesus was doing the miracles that only the Messiah, only God could do. Jesus was teaching as one having authority. That means that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders were not being seen as the authority. So where did Nicodemus go and what time of day did he go? What time did he, did he go to Jesus? He went by night. That's strongly implying that he didn't want to be seen with Jesus during the day. He went at night and we, we read in John 3, Then came to Jesus by night, verse 2, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from where? From God. Did he say from the rabbinical schools? Did he say from the University of Jerusalem? Did he, did he say from some other reputable educational institution? No, he said, you've come from God. That's an admission of great proportions, isn't it? To even go that far? So there is a recognition for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So what does Jesus say in verse 3? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we see Jesus. We see him using a physical, natural element of creation, birth, to illustrate a spiritual truth. And isn't that a wonderful opportunity that God gives us when we have a relationship with someone that we can use a bridge of a physical element of creation or a bridge of relationship to then present to them a spiritual truth? I don't know if anybody has a specific example that comes to mind. Anybody have one that just immediately comes to your mind and says, God gave me an opportunity, and I was able to use this particular relationship or this particular uh, bridge. I don't know if anybody had something, but I know that um, for us, we've had a couple of opportunities where we've had a salesman in our house or a sales lady in our house, and they're kind of a captive audience. And I remember one lady, she was trying to sell us, I think it was a vacuum or something, <laughs> and we... Uh, we used the opportunity because you could tell she had come to the end of her sales pitch and she had nothing left to say. She was just a poor college student trying to make money for college. And she was now out of her sales pitch and she says, I'm just doing this to get through the summer to make money so I can pay my school bill. And she said, and she basically said, I don't care if you buy this or not, I had to at least do my sales pitch <laughs> so I could call my manager and say I fulfilled my duties. And we were like, I'm so sorry, we're not interested in your, your vacuum. But then it gave a great opportunity for us to share the gospel with her. And for the next five or 10 minutes, we went through the plan of salvation with her. And it was just because there was a bridge built through a 20 minute sales pitch that we had the opportunity. You, you've had opportunities like that. Sometimes it's a family member where there's already a natural relationship or there's a relationship that gets fixed. And through that, you have opportunity with the gospel. But I love how Jesus uses a physical element. I remember a missionary I worked with in Kenya. He was so good at this. And I remember Dr. Bob telling us in college about learn as much as you can. I know sometimes this whole liberal arts college mentality gets a bad rap. And then I realized there's some good and there's some bad to it. But one of the things that I appreciated is was Dr. Bob would tell us if you can get a breadth and a width and a depth of God's creation it will give you opportunities to connect with people. If you know a little bit about this particular area, you have a connection maybe that you can then have with them for the gospel. 
So did I like sitting through an opera? No. I hated the first opera I went to. Did I enjoy sitting through some of the artist series? No. But I'm thankful for the connections and for some exposure in a right way. And one of the missionaries I was with in Kenya, he was so good at this. And he would talk he would talk about this on our way in and out of Nairobi. And he would say, all these different people that I'm connecting with that God has enabled me to. He said, it's because I learned that I have to be able to show a little bit of interest, have a little bit of knowledge about their area, because that will give me an opportunity with a relationship to be able to make a connection with them, to be able to share the gospel with them. And he was so good at it. Businessmen, pilots, all kinds of different backgrounds and areas. I so appreciated that uh, about this, this missionary. And I've tried to, uh, to use that. So uh, we've tried to tell people through the years, Learn as much as you can about different areas. Get to know people from different backgrounds and walks of life. I'm thankful that I was able to work um, secular jobs. I'm thankful for ministry opportunities, but I'm also thankful for secular jobs that I had all through college and even grad school. And uh, having to uh, rub shoulders with various people from various walks of life. And uh, I'll have to admit, I've loved it. I've enjoyed it since I've come here. In the last three years, I've learned more about farming than I ever knew. I think it's great. I mean, I was asking Bob the other day about why are they um, harvesting the corn this side of Hoosier Heartland when the corn on the other side is still green. I mean, I'm just learning all kinds of things. I, I love it. But I'm thankful for all these different opportunities, and it's so good for us with the gospel to have a connection, a relationship, a bridge. There are people who are here in our church because someone made a connection with them at a job site, at a workplace, a friendship through a particular league or whatever it is, and that has led to people not always staying, but many times even just coming and hearing and visiting. And it's just incredible the ways that God uses those connections. And Jesus witnesses to Nicodemus. He uses the example of birth. He continues down in verse 5, and he he hits Nicodemus in verse 5 with another truth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is saying, wait a minute here, I'm in the kingdom. I'm a reputable member of the kingdom already. What do you mean I have to be born again? And of course, Nicodemus is now beginning to think only on physical terms, and he's like, can you go back into my mother's womb? But Jesus was trying to get him to think on a totally different spiritual level because he thought of himself as self-righteous, as an illustrious member of the kingdom already. And what did Jesus do? He exposed his sin. He said, you have to be born of water and of the word. What is the water? He's talking about the cleansing. What did they say is the cleansing in the religious, in the system of the law that the Pharisees were so dependent on? They were talking about the ceremonial washings. What's the water that Jesus is talking about here? What's that? Okay. But the baptism of whom? The Holy Spirit. It can't be water baptism or it's you're baptized and you're also repenting. And it's then a baptismal regeneration added to. I don't believe it's water baptism because I believe that it has to be the spiritual cleansing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there's a baptismal regeneration that could be added here. Okay, just, just to give you a little bit of, of, of where I'm coming from, I know there's an interpretational challenge here, but this, the water in Ephesians 5 is what? The Word of God, exactly. So the cleansing is the spiritual cleansing that comes by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. The washing of the water by the word. Okay, we could also, as some people will argue, the water is physical birth. You have to be physically born and then you're spiritually born. I I get that as well. But I really see it as the washing of the water by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what is he hitting Nicodemus with? You have a wrong understanding of the word of God. You have a wrong understanding of spiritual cleansing. You are thinking you can cleanse yourself by all your good works, by all your heaping for doctrines, the commandments of men. 
You think that you are self-righteously cleansing yourself, and Jesus is shutting that down, isn't he? He's saying your cleansing is only by the Spirit through the Word of God. We're talking about a spiritual cleansing that you can't get on your own. And he says this is a rebirth, this is a birth by God himself through the Spirit, by the Word of God. So he's really nailing him on his sin, but he does it in a gentle and a kind and a loving way, breaking down his wrong sinful thought patterns and his pride that's preventing him from coming to Christ in true saving faith. We know the rest of the, the passage very well. Of course, John three sixteen. But what does he appeal to in John 3 and verse 14? Where does he take him back to? What's he point to from the Old Testament? Again, we see him using the scriptures, lifting up the... Do you think that Nicodemus would have known the Old Testament? That would have been a major story, right? A major account, a major event in Israel's history. And how were they saved when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? How were they saved? By looking at that bronze serpent on the pole, right? Picturing what? Saving faith. But they had to believe that that bite by that serpent was deadly. They had to turn from that sinful way and they had to look in faith. He was calling Nicodemus to turn from his sinful, self-righteous, works-righteous way to repent of that and to look to Christ who is lifted up on the cross. So Nicodemus had to turn from, he had had to see his sin, his self-righteousness. He had to see that as condemning him to an eternal hell. He thought he was in the kingdom, right with God, all of his self-righteousness and Jesus took that down and said, what, in John 3 and verse 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, monogenes, his one and only unique son, the God-man, Jesus Christ, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He took apart Nicodemus' works-based religion. You believe in God's son, You cannot do this on your own. So we see a wonderful evangelistic example in this case study in John 3. And then in John 4, the next chapter, who was Jesus witnessing witnessing to in John 4? A Samaritan, a hated group. Racial barriers, cultural barriers, all those demographical barriers that had to come down, right? And Jesus walks to that Well, and we know without having time to read every detail, he confronts her, and how does he expose her sinfulness? Because she has to, like Nicodemus, he has to be exposed for his self-righteousness. She didn't so much have self-righteousness, but she still had an obstacle. I think I saw a hand. Yeah, she, had, she knew that she was, yeah, she had, her five, had five husbands and she was living with a man. So what was, what was her barrier, in a sense, to the gospel? I, I know it's sin. Nicodemus had a barrier with his own sin. What was her barrier, in a sense? She knew that she was wrong. She knew that, I mean, she had five, five husbands living with a man. There was some recognition of her own immoral state, right? But what was still her barrier? What did Jesus bring up? What's that? Worship. Yes. What was her? What was her hang up? In some ways, it's not too different from Nicodemus, right? In her mind, you Jews have been prejudiced against us. Your phobias and your phobic and your your prejudiced and your racist, right? What did she? What was she saying? Is ultimately we have our way as Samaritans. We worship on our mountain because you Jews and your racism and your prejudices, you cast us out. You've kept, right? So was there not a self-righteousness in her mind as well? 
she had a better understanding of her sinfulness. Yeah, I'm not really doing right. I know that, but it's really you Jews. It's really your fault. We are worshiping where we believe we should because you wouldn't let us come to Jerusalem or whatever, you know. But what did Jesus say when he broke that down in verse 24, I believe it is? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. By the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and in truth, according to the word of God. He's been using scriptural teachings. She wants to argue about place of worship and prejudices and blame. And Jesus breaks that all down by saying, your sin that even you innately recognize that now you are trying to deflect from by accusing the Jews of keeping you from worshiping where you should and you are claiming that yours is just as high and holy place, he breaks all that down and says the problem is that you're really not truly worshiping God like you think you are. Because you're not worshiping according to the word of God in truth, and you're not worshiping according to the spirit because you don't know God, the true God. And he breaks down those barriers and he calls her out for her sinful worship, her sinful trust. Was Nicodemus just as wrong? Sure. His trust was in his self-righteousness. He didn't even see his need for any kind of getting right. He saw himself as an illustrious member of the kingdom already. Jesus broke that down. Jesus broke down her barriers and gave them the gospel. Now Nicodemus, we believe later, came to Christ. Later he's defending Jesus and then what did Nicodemus do at the end of his, when, when, excuse me, when Jesus was crucified? What did Nicodemus do? Yeah, he came with Joseph of Arimathea and helped prepare his body. I believe at that point we're seeing an evidence of salvation. Now what happened with the woman at the well? What happened with her? Yeah, she got saved that day and went and told. The evidence is she went and told her family and friends. And they came by the droves. And many of them got saved through her witness as they came to Jesus Christ. So Nicodemus, it seems later, woman at the well, it was right then and there. Do we not have opportunities like that? We witness, we witness, we witness. Sometimes we see it right then and there. Sometimes it's later. Sometimes it's even um, without our knowledge. Uh, we never know uh, what the Lord is doing. Any comments or questions so far? I know we're running out of time, but yes. Yeah, this, this is a tremendous passage for me because, you know, the woman at the well, I mean, she's waiting, actually looking for the Messiah because she says uh, when he comes, he will tell us all things, and then Jesus says, I, I speak to you. Yeah. She, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. He, in my haste, trying to get through this lesson, I didn't even spend time on that part where, of course, Jesus knew about her past, and then he declares himself to be the Messiah standing in front of her. Yeah. So he takes her to the truth of the word of God, and he exposes her sin, but he reveals that he is the one and the only one who can save her. So great, great point. Uh, just a couple more here that we'll look at. Um, and then we'll finish with hopefully some practical tips. But we see Jesus in Luke 18, the rich young ruler. This is what great comfort in the way of the master patterns his evangelistic efforts. And there are times where we can use this method. I think that these kind of cold turkey um, opportunities are, are, are challenging. Uh, but Ray Comfort has a, a way in which he does it. There are opportunities that God gives us in a cold turkey confrontational <laughs> type of way. Jesus, in a sense, does this in Luke 18. The rich young ruler, he is asking um, in, in Luke 18, let me make sure I get to the right place here. Um, certain young ruler, or a certain ruler asked him, saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he begins with a question, and Jesus takes him to, um, uh, why callest thou me good, none is good? save one that is God. So immediately he begins to deal with the moral argument. And then he begins to give some of the commandments. Adultery, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not kill. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. He gives five. 
Of course, we know the rich young ruler won't even admit to violating those five, though he probably had in his thought life. Even if he hadn't murdered, he probably had some bitterness or hate at some point. Even though he may uh, uh, not have committed adultery, he had probably had an adulterous thought. Surely he had disobeyed his mom and dad at some point, right? Surely he had told a lie at some point. Or maybe he hadn't stolen something. More than likely he had. Or at least he had coveted. But of course he didn't see himself as that bad of a person in his self-righteousness. He thought that he was a pretty good dude and could get there on his own. Then Jesus, of course, revealed his covetousness and revealed his sin that was preventing him from true saving faith and what did the rich young ruler do? He had much goods, so he went away sorrowful. He loved his sin. He loved his money. He did not see that he had violated God's command. This is the pattern that Ray Comfort uses in the way of the master. The rich young ruler, we don't know if he ever got saved. But there are times where we witness to somebody. And sometimes we do, in a sense, push the button. We expose the area, don't we? That they're, I've done this in counseling and witnessing. You get so far sometimes with some people, and I've done this where I have touched on something that I knew was near and dear to their heart, that was an area they were struggling with. And you know how it is sometimes you press on that sore spot, and what do they do? They scream. It's like my mom when we used to cut ourselves, and we'd she'd put that, um, I forget that spray, it later just was a liquid that she'd put on our, and it would, yeah, it would hurt. It would hurt. Bactine or whatever it was called. Yeah. I mean, you first put that on or even peroxide and they scream. And what do you say? It's for your good. It's going to make it better. It's going to keep the infection out. This gospel that I'm giving you that you're screaming at, it is the best thing for you. It is love. It is because I care for your soul. The rich young ruler didn't see it that way, did it? Did he? He saw Jesus as an offense. How dare you tell me to go and salt? Was Jesus saying that he had to earn his way to heaven? What was Jesus doing? He was exposing his covetousness. He wasn't willing to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Christ. He wanted to add Jesus to his wealth and his fame and whatever else he had. He didn't want to depend completely and wholly on Christ and Christ alone for his salvation. He didn't want to give up his sin. And that's where I think a lot of people are at. They would just want to add Jesus on. They just want to make Jesus one of the, the gurus of their life, their life coach. <laughs> or as the missionaries have described, going to some of these foreign countries. And they just want to add Jesus to one of their gods on their polytheistic shelf. And that's not what Jesus was saying. He's saying, you've got to come to me fully, all the way, and uh, confess your sin. And the rich young ruler at that moment wasn't willing to do that. We're almost out of time. I think I had one more on there. Then I was going to give some real quick practical tips. With a woman caught in adultery, this one has been controversial because people were trying to say he excused her sin, but that's not what he was doing. There were a lot of other issues with that group that brought her where was the guy if they caught her in the very act where was the guy the law required that the man also be punished there was re reason to believe that they also were involved in the scheme so they too were guilty of adultery I mean there's a lot of other things that come into play but what did he say to the woman at the end go and sin no more sin he called her fornication sin her adultery sin and confronted her. We don't know, at least as best we can tell, she, she did trust Christ, but we don't know for sure. Uh, it seems that she did uh, come in saving faith. But those are four examples. There are uh, other examples we could draw from the life of Christ, but of course, as the master evangelist, I believe those are four excellent case studies. We'll close with tips for evangelism. Sometimes all we're doing is planting seeds of thought, but we should do so with the truth, with Scripture. Getting them thinking about the gospel. We realize that the gospel challenges their wrong ideas, their false theologies, their sinful thought patterns. We can use just conversation. Just talking about this, that, or the other, as Jesus did with Nicodemus, and then it became 
a bridge to the gospel, to the facts of the gospel. You know, it might start with the weather or work or whatever, and then it leads to the truth of the gospel, scripture. Sometimes we have to define terms and ask questions. Many times we have to ask questions because their terminology that they're using, they may not define it the way the Bible does. What do you mean by that? And go further with the question. How, how do you determine then who is right and wrong? You call that or this person wrong or this person or this or that evil. But what makes it right or wrong, good or evil? Who determines that? You're calling my thinking and me intolerant and exclusive. Well, who determines that? What makes you right and your truth right and mine wrong? And why is Putin and um, all these other dictators, what makes them wrong? And why is Hamas not right or Hezbollah right? Some people think they are. Why is Israel wrong, right? And we can get into all this moral back and forth, right and wrong. Who determines? Seems like there needs to be a standard, right? <laughs> so there's ways. Um, who will judge good and evil in the end? What about these people that seem to get away with their crimes? Who's going to take care of all this evil? Who's going to determine judgment in the end? Take some, and then that gives us the opportunity, Lord willing, to take them to the Scripture. The Bible is the authority. Verses, parts of verses, summaries of passages with the central truth. Sometimes it's hard to remember the address, isn't it? I'll get back to you on that. Or I know it's in the book of John. Or <laughs> Sometimes we have to go back to the back and look it up on the, in the reference. Thankfully, we have phones nowadays that have a search. Uh, you can go to a keyword. Uh, or always to be gracious, always with grace, seasoned with salt. Don't apologize for the truth. The truth can hurt, but it is healing medicine for a sin sick soul. And then remember the importance of relationship. Sometimes, see, when, sometimes in our in our debate world, not that there isn't room for debate, but we want to win an argument, don't we? And really, it's not about winning an argument. We want to keep the relationship as best we can. They may cut us off because we believed in the Bible. We believe Jesus is the only way. We have confronted them in their sin. They, they may cut us off, but God is still able to do a work and convict them even without us in their presence. But we want to try as best we can to keep the, the relationship. Did Jesus keep the relationship with Nicodemus? Sure he did. Probably even the rich young ruler, though the rich young ruler may have never seen Jesus again. We don't know. But he kept the relationship with Nicodemus to the point that Nicodemus at the end when Jesus is body is being taken to the tomb. He's with Joseph of Arimathea. So we try to keep that relationship, even though uh, they may be mad or under conviction or whatever. Uh, maybe they'll come back later and ask a question. We'll have another opportunity. But see people where they are at, knowing God can save them and make them new. All right, we'll close with that. Any closing comments or questions? I do have uh, some bookmarks on evangelism. I'm going to put these in the back on the, the two tables, one lobby and one on the back table there. Um, there's maybe 60, 65 of these. If you would like to take a bookmark, there's key verses, some reminders about evangelism. Help yourselves to these. I'll put those in the back, and they're free. And uh, take as many as you'd like. If you want to take more than one, that's fine as well. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll get ready for the service. Lord, thank you for this series on evangelism. May our hearts be burdened for the lost. Pray you continue to give us divine appointments and opportunities with the truth of the Word of God to share the gospel, that we might see souls saved and lives changed, and your kingdom furthered for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll get ready for the service in about